Hi guys, as a tour guide I prepared the most complete Tuscany travel guide to show you all the best places and experiences this amazing Italian region has to offer. I'll show you more than 50 top things to do in Tuscany from all the best places including Pisa, Lucca, Florence, San Gimignano, Monte Rigioni, Siena and Elba Island and share my favorite tips and tricks for your perfect Tuscany vacation. So let's start with Pisa that received its world fame due to one of the biggest engineering flops in history. But Pisa is so much more than its leaning tower as the rest of the town is also absolutely spectacular. One of the best places to start exploring Pisa is the top of its defensive walls. Pisa got its city walls in the 1200s when it was one of the most powerful and the richest republics on the planet. These 800 years old defensive walls are still surrounding almost the entire old town. They were never conquered by any army and that is why Pisa is so beautifully preserved. From the 11 meters or 36 feet high walls you'll see the entire old town as the trail stretches for 3 kilometers or 1.9 miles. At the peak of its power, Pisa was defeated in a sea battle by Genoa that ended its golden days. But despite its defeat, the town remained intact. Ticket office with a starting point is on a famous square of miracles right next to the cemetery at Santa Maria Tower. But how did a small Pisa manage to become one of the world's richest towns? In the Middle Ages, international trade was done by ships. Pisa had one of the largest merchants and navy fleets, as at the time, the city was a seaport. Even more than that, the most important river in Tuscany connected wealthy towns met the sea right in Pisa. That is why the riverbanks were the heart of the city. Here, influential and wealthy families built their lavish residences. These elegant streets on the banks of the river Arno have become known as Lugarni di Pisa and all of their names begin with the word Lungarno. But what happened to the sea? Over the centuries, the river had been accumulating silt and slowly moving the shoreline and today beaches are about 10 kilometers or 6.5 miles away. But another mystery of Pisa is its elite medieval order which still exists today. Night Square was the center of power in medieval Pisa and this palace of knights was the headquarters of an elite medieval order. The story starts in the 16th century when the city was ruled by Florence and its powerful Medici family. The head of the family, Cosimo I, spent a lot of time in Pisa. You see, Cosimo just founded a new order of Saint Stephen reserved for noblemen only. Officially, the objective of the order was to fight the Ottomans and the pirates that sailed the Mediterranean Sea, but who knows what else was on the agenda. So Cosimo turned this square into a renaissance headquarters of the order by building the Church of St. Stephen of the Knights and the Palace of the Knights. Cosimo I stands in front of the palace that is now used by one of the most prestigious universities in Italy. This square is also a meeting place of six streets and one of them will take you to the most elegant shopping area of Pisa. From the square and down to the river runs a set of ancient pedestrian streets. These streets were connecting a very important Piazza dei Cavalieri with the river Arno and that is why they have become an important and lively commercial space and Borgo Street was at its heart. This area is full of medieval architecture with arcades, old palaces and even a church as this is one of the oldest parts of Pisa. The street is called Nero for obvious reasons and is famous for its fine designer stores and boutique shops. Shopping experience continues on the other side of the river with more modern Corso Italia Street. These streets are an essential part of shopping experience in Pisa where you can also find restaurants and lovely cafes. But the historic and charming Borgo Street also offers a true medieval atmosphere. The street ends right here at the river with Piazza Garibaldi. And since we're again at Arno, let me show you another interesting and beautiful thing. Squeezed between the river and the road is a tiny church that looks a bit out of place. But in the 1200s, when this church was built, the riverbanks were the center of the town life and the river was the main highway. Just by looking at this marble exterior full of beautiful gothic style artwork, it becomes obvious how important this church was. It was built to house a reliquary of a thorn from Christ's crown, hence its name Santa Maria della Spina, as Spina translates into a thorn. 
Originally, the church was built right next to the river, but was dismantled and raised higher in the 1800s. However, during the move, many marble sections disappeared. The interior is a lot less glamorous, with a simple design that can be visited between March and October when it hosts different exhibitions. The Roman Catholic Church had a huge influence at the time when Pisa reached its golden days. That is why most Pisa landmarks are religious structures. Strong religious influence also reflected in art and this Benedictine convent now houses the largest collection of artworks in Pisa. It houses a unique collection of crucifixes throughout the ages placed side by side to illustrate the changes of the art style over time. Here are also sculptural masterworks by Nicola Pisano, known as the founder of modern sculpture and a brilliant Florentine sculptor Donatello. The museum has very quirky opening times, so you should check it before visiting. But the best masterpieces of Pisa are not in the museums, but on a huge square of miracles. On the square are four amazing white marble buildings built in the golden age of Pisa between the 11 and the 1200s. And the best way to see them is to buy a combined ticket. At the northern edge of the square is Campo Santo. This walled marble cemetery was built around a shipload of sacred souls from Jerusalem, taken from the very spot where Jesus was crucified. During the Third Crusade, the soil was brought to Pisa by the Archbishop, and that is how the name Campo Santo or Holy Field was born. It has a gothic covered walkway, and its inner court is surrounded by a set of round arches with beautiful tracery. Walls are decorated with restored frescoes from the 14th and 15th century, showing the theme of life and death. Next is a beautiful baptistry dedicated to St. John the Baptist. This round marble building is still the largest baptistry in Italy, and it is even slightly higher than the Leaning Tower. It has a unique blend of two architectural styles, as the lower part has rounded arches in Romanesque style, while the upper sections have pointed arches in the Gothic style. In the center of the spacious interior is a big marble octagonal baptismal font from the 1200s with a bronze sculpture of St. John the Baptist. There is also an impressive pulpit sculpted by Nicola Pisano from the same period. You can also climb to the dome to get better perspective of the impressive round space. The most famous building on the square is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It serves as a freestanding bell tower of the cathedral and it took 199 years to be finished. In 1178, the foundations of the tower were laid, but they were only 3 meters or 9 feet deep. To make things worse, at the time, Pisa was a coastal town with a retracting coastline and unstable ground. So unavoidably, after the second floor was built, a heavy stone tower began to sink. As design was flawed from the beginning and the Republic was busy fighting wars, construction was halted. This allowed for the underlying soil to settle and in 1233 the second part of the construction began. In an effort to compensate for the tilt, the engineers built upper floors with one side taller than the other. Because of this approach, the tower is slightly curved. But the construction was again halted when Pisa was defeated by Genoa. After four more decades, the tower was finally completed with the construction of a seventh floor and a bell chamber for seven bells, one for each note of the musical major scale. But the tower kept on leaning. In the late 1500s, famous physics from Pisa, Galileo Galilei, dropped from the top two cannonballs of different masses to demonstrate that their speed was independent of their mass. By the 1990s, the tilt had reached 5.5 degrees and long-lasting work of stabilizing the foundation was finished in 2001 when the tilt was reduced to 4 degrees. It's hard to say how tall the tower is as it depends on where you measure it, but it's pretty clear that if you want to get to the top, you need to climb 251 steps as there is no lift. Just don't forget to book ahead. But the most impressive landmark of Pisa is the biggest, the richest and the oldest building on the Square of Miracles, the Cathedral. With this church, the Republic of Pisa wanted to show its power. They wanted to build something the world has never seen before, and so they did. When built, 
this was the most spectacular and the biggest Roman Catholic cathedral on the planet. After Pisa defeated the Saracens in Sicily, they used a huge war booty to build this cathedral. It was intended to reflect the international power of the Republic by mixing different architectural styles from different cultures and religions. This new architectural style was called Pisan Romanesque and features a grey and white marble exterior with countless details. Interior is made of a striking, alternating black and white marble and features narrow arches with a pointed crown typical for mosques. Impressive ceiling is embellished with gold and over the centuries the cathedral has been adorned with numerous works of art. But marble pulpit by Giovanni Pisano is the highlight as it revolutionized medieval sculpture by introducing figures detached from the background. Visit to the cathedral is free of charge, but you do need a fixed time free pass available exclusively from the ticket office on the square. In case you buy any ticket for the Square of Miracles, you can enter the cathedral whenever you want. As there is plenty more to see and do around here, I also prepared a list of my favorite Pisa tours and experiences in the description below. Less than 20 kilometers or 12 miles from Pisa is one of Tuscany's most beloved towns called Lucca. Its mighty defensive walls are protecting its amazing heritage, ancient mysteries and legends. Impressive defensive walls are the landmark of Lucca. Over the centuries, they've successfully protected the town, managed to avoid world wars and remained almost completely intact. Walls of Lucca rise 12 meters or 40 feet above the ground and offer great views. Loop trail along the top encircles the entire old town and takes about an hour of walking. First walls were built by the Romans, but its current fourth iteration is from the 16 and 1700s. The latest walls were built to protect the town against cannons, so their base is massive, reaching 30 meters or almost 100 feet wide. There are also 11 bastions and 6 town gates. In the late 1800s, the walls were turned into a public park and have become a popular recreational area. Thanks to the walls, Luca managed to stay independent for more than 700 years until French military leader Napoleon Bonaparte became the only person to ever conquer the town. And this square is officially named after him, although the citizens are calling it Piazza Grande. Square has always been the center of political power, but before Napoleon it was very different. After Napoleon conquered Tuscany in 1805, he gave Luca to his sister Elisa Bonaparte. One of her projects was a reconstruction of this square. According to Elisa's plans, the square should be dominated by a big statue of Napoleon, but in his place stands a statue of Marie-Louise of Bourbon. After Napoleon was defeated, Marie-Louise replaced Elisa and placed her statue in front of the public palace. From the main square, we go to the main street. Ancient Street via Filungo runs right through the heart of the historic center. It begins at one of the city gates and ends right here at Canto de Arco, a famous intersection of four streets right in the middle of the old town that also serves as a traditional meeting point for the citizens. This narrow and picturesque medieval street is the best shopping area in Lucca. It is lined with many shops, elegant clothes and shoe boutiques, jewelry shops, cafes and restaurants. In addition to the main Italian and international chains, here are also historic shops of artisans with handmade clothes and accessories. They are housed in historical palaces and houses, but the street is also lined with churches and even a famous medieval clock tower, the highest building in town. Like other medieval Tuscan towns, Luca also had its towers. They were constructed during unstable medieval times by rich families for personal protection and to show off their power and wealth. And this is the base of the highest tower, rising 50 meters or 165 feet. Tower was built in the 1200s and was later acquired by the government and changed into a clock tower. Over the years the clock mechanism has changed and the current one is dating to the 1700s. You can climb its 207 steps to enjoy one of the best views of Luca. The tower also features a legend of a woman named Lucida Mansi. She sold her soul to the devil in order to remain young and beautiful. 
on the last night of the 30-year agreement, just before the devil came to collect his payment, Lucinda climbed the tower in an attempt to stop the hands of the clock. As she couldn't reach the clock in time, the devil collected her soul and she haunts the tower to this day. But there is another and even more unique medieval tower. Next tower from the 1300s is different as it has trees growing on its top. It belonged to Guinji family, a ruling noble family that brought a period of peace and prosperity to Luca. They owned a complex of these two palaces opposite to each other and the tower was part of it. On the top of the tower, the Guinji family created a roof garden with home oaks to show off their wealth and power. The tower's green summit has become Luca's symbol and the descendants of the family donated the tower to the local government. To get to the unusual roof garden 45 meters or 130 feet above the town, you'll need to climb 233 steps. But besides the medieval towers, Luca is also a town of music. Famous Italian composer and author of world-famous operas was born in that house on the corner of this square in 1858. His name was Giacomo Puccini. Puccini spent his early years in Lucca before moving to Milan and its world-famous opera house La Scala. Puccini's birth home is now a museum situated on the second floor of a historic building. In this house, Giacomo lived his happy childhood years until, at the age of six, his father had passed away. Later, the apartment was sold, but after becoming a successful composer, Giacomo bought it back. In the 1970s, the Puccini family donated the apartment to be transformed into a museum. The rooms were restored to their original appearance and contained objects, letters, paintings and other precious items that once belonged to the famous composer. About half an hour's journey from Luca, you can also visit the composer's villa, still in the hands of the Puccini family. Just a stone throw from the Puccini Museum is a large square with a beautiful church of San Michele in Foro. The church is so impressive that it's often mistaken for Luca's cathedral. Last part of the name in Foro means at Forum, as this used to be the most important square of ancient Roman town called the Forum. The first church was standing here already in the 700s, but it was rebuilt by the orders of Pope Alexander in the 1100s. Facade is a magnificent piece of art from the 13th century with sculptures and inlays. There are four orders of small loggias, and on the top, flanked by two other angels, is a statue of Saint Michael the Archangel to whom the church is dedicated. The interior with two aisles and a nave is adorned with beautiful artwork. Among others, you can admire Madonna with a child and a panel portraying the four saints. The church also has an elegant bell tower built between the 12th and 14th centuries. But if you feel peckish, just look next to the tower and pop into the historical, family-run Taducci pastry shop. Here they bake a traditional sweetbread buccellato. It is made of flour, sugar, aniseed and raisins and is naturally leavened. Here they have a saying that anyone who comes to Luca and doesn't eat buccellato can say they have been there. So I'll make sure that I can say I have been in Luca. It is eaten all year and is shaped in the form of a ring or a loaf. Mm. This ancient bread originates from Roman times as its name derives from the Latin word for bite. Luca has many beautiful squares, but the most interesting one is famous for its elliptical shape. Unique shape derives from the ancient Roman amphitheater that used to stand here and could accommodate 10,000 spectators. During unstable medieval times, many ancient Roman structures were converted into fortresses. This amphitheater was no exception, as all of its outside arches were closed to make it impenetrable. Later, the ruins were covered by houses that were built on the remaining walls preserving the oval outline of the arena. You can still find traces of the original walls, but the base of the ancient structure is buried about 9 feet deep. The remaining vaults and arches have been incorporated into old houses that circle the plaza. All around the square are shops and restaurants, and the central part has become a popular meeting area. You can enter the square through one of its four gateways, one at each of the four extremes of the ellipse. But one of the most impressive buildings in Lucca is its splendid Romanesque cathedral dedicated to St. Martin, the patron saint of Lucca. 
church was built by reusing ancient colonies and capitals and was consecrated in 1070 by Pope himself. The exterior was later elaborated in the 1200s with the addition of marble facade, arcades, beautifully decorated doors and elegant portico where a mysterious labyrinth is carved on one of the pillars. The interior guards three great masterpieces and because of one of them, this church became a famous pilgrim site in the early Middle Ages. First masterpiece is Ilaria del Careto's tomb and represents one of the finest works of the 15th century Italian sculpture. Second masterpiece is Madonna and Child enthroned with saints. But the third masterpiece is the one that had been attracting pilgrims for centuries. It is called Volto Santo or the Holy Face. This is a large-scale wooden crucifix guarded inside an octagonal chapel. It is very unusual as it shows Christ wearing a tunic and his eyes are open to show triumph over death. But the most mysterious part is that no one knows its origin. According to the legend, it was carved by Nicodemus, a man who helped to bury Jesus after the crucifixion. That is why it shows the true face of Christ and it apparently even contained an ample of the blood of Christ in a hollow behind the shoulders. The cathedral also has a small museum that includes interesting vestments that have been used during the Volta Santo festival since medieval time. You can also climb the bell tower from the 1200s to enjoy spectacular views. Interestingly, Luca hosts the largest annual comics festival in Europe known as Luca Comics and Games. It happens at the end of October when lovers of cartoon characters, animation and gaming from all over Europe gather right here. As there is plenty more to see and do around here, I also prepared a list of my favorite Luca tours and experiences in the description below. About 80 kilometers or 50 miles from Luca is the capital of Tuscany, the city of Florence. Amazing city of art is known to be the birthplace of the Renaissance and holds some of the biggest masterpieces of architecture and art in the world. The best place to start exploring Florence is by visiting a huge lookout terrace built at the spot where the medieval city wall ended. It is named after the great Renaissance artist Michelangelo who lived and worked here. From here you'll get the most iconic skyline of the city as most of the panoramic photos of Florence you've seen were taken right here. In the middle of the square is a bronze replica of the famous work of Michelangelo, a statue of David, as a reminder that the Renaissance gave Florence some of the greatest art treasures in the world. Descent to Pitti Palace, a residence of Grand Dukes and rulers of Tuscany, the Medici family. They were one of the wealthiest and most influential families in the history of Italy. The Medici family owned the biggest bank in the world and they produced four popes and two queens of France. With their immense wealth and power, they created an environment in which art could flourish and that's why Florence is the birthplace of the Renaissance. The palace now houses four museums, but if you don't have much time, head straight to the palace park known as Boboli Gardens. For almost four centuries, these gardens were exclusive for the Grand Dukes of Tuscany and for a short while kings of Italy. They are like an open-air museum with statues, fountains and even caves and have become a model for many European courts. From the palace and its gardens, head on the other side of the river using the same bridge that was used by the Dukes of Florence. Beautiful Ponte Vecchio or the Old Bridge is the only remaining bridge with houses and shops on it. The Dukes of the Medici family actually moved above the ordinary people as they used a secret passageway built on the top of the houses. Bridge initially housed butcher shops, but the smell disturbed the Medici family and the butchers were replaced by goldsmiths that still occupy the bridge. The old bridge crosses the Arno River, a vital source of power for the Florentine medieval textile industry. Arno was also used as a main trade route for transport of goods, enabling an international trade that brought a lot of wealth to the city. Right next to the river is the Uffizi Gallery with some of the best-known art pieces in the world from Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Botticelli, Caravaggio and other famous Renaissance artists. One of the oldest and most spectacular art museums in the world was built by the Medici family to house their offices, hence the name Uffizi. 
This is a vast labyrinth of office spaces and long corridors where the Medici family kept their private art collections with some of the most important art pieces in the world. When the House of Medici died out, they donated their art collections to the city of Florence under two conditions. First was that the collection never leaves Florence and the second was that the collection is open to the public. That is why Uffizi is one of the oldest art museums that has been open since 1760. Right next to the famous gallery open up one of the most impressive squares in Italy, Piazza della Signoria. This has been the heart of Florence and its most important meeting place since the 14th century. Square was also always used as an open-air art gallery. That is why in its corner is Loggia dei Lanzi, a fantastic outdoor sculpture gallery filled with amazing statues and the best part is you can simply walk in without even buying a ticket, but the most famous statue of them all stands right in front of the town hall. A replica of Michelangelo's David replaced the original that had been standing here since its creation. Here is also an impressive statue of Hercules and Cacos, the fountain of Neptune, and a statue of Cosimo de' Medici, who established the Medici family as rulers of Florence. Square is dominated by the fortress palace that serves as the town hall and a museum. This is the main symbol of civil power and a landmark of Florence since the 1300s. It has an iconic 94-meter high tower and offers beautiful panoramic views. If you want to see the original David, you should visit another spectacular gallery, Academia. David was commissioned as one of the statues of the roofline of the Florence Cathedral. When finished, it was so remarkable that instead of the roofline, it was placed in front of the town hall. Head over to the largest and the oldest food market in Florence where you can grab a delicious lunch. On the ground floor, you'll find a lively food market, while on the spacious first floor, you can find great high-quality food stands with fresh and tasty Tuscan food and other traditional products. As Florence is home of many high-end fashion designers, you should take some time to stroll down its beautiful streets. Via de Tornabuoni is considered the fashion center of the city. Around the city, you'll also find many charming squares and lively streets with beautiful shops, cafes and restaurants. Finally, head over to the cathedral, where right across from its main entrance stands one of the oldest buildings in Florence. The octagonal baptistry is covered with white and green marble. Its three amazing golden doors hint that the interior holds a special dome decorated with golden mosaics from the 1200s. The best way to enter baptistry is to get a combined ticket that includes the baptistry, the dome, the bell tower and the crypt. The best way to finish your visit in Florence is with its most impressive landmark. When it was finished in the 1400s, it was the biggest church in the world. Its monumental facade is covered with white, pink and green marble. The cathedral, known as Duomo, also includes a world-famous dome and a self-standing bell tower. The top of the bell tower is not even the highest point of this church. The highest point is its dome, the largest brick dome in the world. When built, it revolutionized the way the domes are built as it has two layers. The inner layer is made out of bricks and on the inside it's covered with a fresco of the Last Judgment. The outer layer simply serves as a roof that you can climb on the top and get amazing 360 views. Somehow, this massive dome managed to survive 600 years of thunderstorms, earthquakes and wars and remains the centerpiece of the city skyline. Also be sure to check the QR code or description below where you'll find my favorite Florence tours and experiences. About 55 kilometers or 35 miles south from Florence, on one of the numerous Tuscan rolling hills is probably the most picturesque old town of San Gimignano known as Medieval Manhattan. The old medieval town has an impressive skyline of stone towers dating from the 12th and 1300s. One of the best places to start exploring San Gimignano is a hilltop park that offers the best free-of-charge views over the skyline. The park was created over the remains of the fortress built by the city of Florence in the 1300s when they took control of San Gimignano to protect it from Siena and internal riots. The Florentines built a massive fortress to house its soldiers, but the fortress tower is almost all that is left from once mighty fort. To get the best idea about the medieval town, you should visit San Gimignano 1300. 
This is a museum, artwork and experience with a very impressive and detailed reconstruction of San Gimignano from the 1300s when the town reached its glory days. Here you can see all of its towers as the model covers 27 square meters or 290 square feet and is made out of hand-painted clay. Towers were built as homes by wealthy families as they offered superior protection over a traditional home in the turbulent Middle Ages. But the tower building soon turned into a competition to show off who has more power and influence. There used to be 72 ancient towers and only 14 have survived to today. One of them is a 28 meter high tower house that belonged to the Camptelli family. They left this tower house with all its furniture and personal belongings to the public. On the inside, you'll have a glimpse of how life looked like inside the tower houses. You'll also be able to see a wonderful movie that explains 1000 years of development in San Gimignano. Tower building was financed by saffron, a very expensive spice that gives a yellow-orange coloring to foods. San Gimignano was blessed with its strategic position between Florence, Siena and Pisa and through the city ran an important ancient trade and pilgrim route from France to Rome. Because of this, San Gimignano could easily transport their famous local product, saffron, to profitable markets and the city became wealthy. Saffron is still produced here and you'll find it on the menu of all the restaurants in town. This spice has repeatedly saved San Gimignano because it was used as a currency to pay off debts incurred during the wars. San Gimignano is still surrounded by its medieval walls and using the old city gates is still the only way in and out of the old town. You can walk along the perimeter of the 13th century city walls. The walk is about 2.1 km or 1.3 mile, passing massive portals and enjoying splendid views. San Gimignano is also home to modest-looking churches housing incredible artwork. One of them is a plain-looking San Agostino brick church from the 13th century. The interior is hiding amazing 15th century frescoes showing 19 scenes from the life of St. Augustine from his boyhood in North Africa to his death. For art lovers, this is one of the most important things to see in San Gimignano. Narrow streets will take you to the heart of the town, the triangular main square. The 13th century square is surrounded by towers and serves as a marketplace, stage for festivals, tournaments and all major events. The square got its name after a big underground cistern that lies under the square and was used to provide drinking water for the city. That is why in the middle of the square sits this stone well. All around, you can find shops and cafes where you can sit down and admire the view. Right opposite to the stone well, you can find the best gelato in the world. Gelato. My name is Sergio Dondoli. I am not the owner of the gelato shop. The owner is my wife. I just produce here 30 years the gelato. But I don't know why it's, why it's the best in the world. I don't know. But it's not bad. I promise you. I promise you. This is the most delicious landmark in the history of landmarks. To call this an ice cream would be an understatement. It's more like an art. And when you add this medieval surroundings, this is the best gelato experience in the world. I recommend you to try unique local flavors like saffron or vernacchia. On the main square, there are two places that both claim to have the best gelato in the world. They won medals and plaques to prove it, but you know, if you're not sure which one is the best, I think you should try both. Mm. Right next to the main square is another square, Piazza del Duomo, dominated by the cathedral. This rather simple-looking Roman Catholic church is the main church in town. It was consecrated in 1148 in the presence of the Pope himself. On the outside, it doesn't look particularly impressive, but on the inside, it is spectacular. Walls are covered with some of the most outstanding frescoes from the 14th century. There are whole cycles of different scenes that are telling stories from the Bible. The church also stole relics of San Gimignanus, the patron of the town. Right next to the cathedral rises the tallest tower of San Gimignano and the only one you can climb to its top. It is part of the 13th century town hall and is known as the Fat Tower. 
To stop the rivalry over who will have the tallest tower in town, the local council passed a law that no tower was to be taller than this one. The town hall houses offices of the town council on the ground floor, while its upper floors are occupied by the Civic Museum and Art Gallery with impressive works of medieval masters. The museum and art gallery ticket also gives you access to the tower. From the top of the 54 meters or 170 feet tall tower, you'll get the best unobstructed 360 view of San Gimignano and its beautiful countryside. Be sure to also check the description below or use the QR code to see my favorite San Gimignano tours and experiences. Halfway between two beautiful Tuscan towns, San Gimignano and Siena, you should stop for a quick visit to one of the most impressive medieval walled villages, Monterigioni. This small, fortified place was built in the 1200s by the city of Siena during the time of great rivalry between Siena and Florence as the area was constantly being battled over by the two cities. The intact 45 walls have 14 towers and you can take a walk on the 800-year-old walls. This fort was successfully defended for more than 300 years until Siena made a terrible mistake and put in charge of the garrison a man that has been exiled from Florence. In an act of reconciliation, this man simply handed the keys of the fort over to the Florentine army that walked inside the walls without a fight. Just a few miles away is another Tuscan pearl, a medieval town of Siena. Its historic city center is like a time capsule with an amazing medieval atmosphere and rich heritage. Like all medieval towns, Siena was protected by the defensive walls and parts of the walls are still surrounding the old town. Through its history, Siena was fighting Florence for dominance in Tuscany. Eventually, Florence won and conquered Siena. Residents of Siena were not happy with Florentine dominance and to prevent uprisings from citizens, the Medici family built a massive military fort for Florentine soldiers. Fortress was built in 16th century and is now used by the residents as a park and a recreational area with a great panoramic view of the city. Siena has an amazing history and part of it is also a fascinating small square, Piazza Salimbeni, surrounded by three palaces. In the middle is the Gothic Palace, notable for still housing the offices on one of the oldest still operating banks in the world, the Monte dei Pasci di Siena. The bank was founded here in 1472. And the amazing part is, the bank is still there. It's like 550 years or something. Siena is also a home of a famous Italian saint who is a patron saint of the entire country. Thanks to St. Catherine, the 13th century church of San Domenico is an important center of Christian spirituality. Church houses a rather peculiar relic of St. Catherine, her head. St. Catherine was born here in Siena and very soon devoted herself to God. She spent a large part of her life inside of these walls and became famous by having mystical phenomena such as stigmata and mystical marriage. This is one of the greatest medieval squares in the world. It is the main square in Siena with its unique shell shape. Square has been the heart of social and political life in Siena, an active market and a racetrack for this crazy traditional horse race called Palio. Every year on July 2nd and August 16th, the famous race takes place here. Horses and jockeys in the colors of rivalry neighborhood race around this square packed with spectators for three laps. If you sit in one of the surrounding cafes and restaurants, you will see this race under TV screens. Square is also a very popular meeting place as every evening people gather to sit on the ground and socialize. You can bring your drinks and snacks. Sitting is okay, but you are not allowed to lay down as you will be asked to get up by the local police. The lowest point of the main square is occupied by a massive 13th century palace. Impressive building from stone and brick is also beautiful on the inside as almost every room is decorated with frescoes. There is also a series of three fresco panels titled The Allegory of Good and Bad Government, painted to remind the rulers of how much was at stake as they made their decisions. You can go inside and see it for yourself since the first floor is the city museum. Most of the palace is still used as a town hall. But the most famous part of the town hall is its tower from the 1300s. It was designed to be taller than the tower in rival Florence. The tower was built to be the same height as the bell tower of Siena Cathedral as a sign that the church and the state had equal power. 
but since it stands at the lowest point of the main square, it is actually much taller. In fact, at the time it was one of the tallest structures in Italy. The name of the tower translates to the Tower of the Eater after the overeating citizen that had a job to strike the hour in the tower. You can get to the top and get great 360 views of Siena, but you better be in good shape because there are 400 steps waiting for you. From the tower you'll get a good view of the most striking building in Siena, a black and white marble cathedral known as Duomo. This Roman Catholic church is already imposing on the outside, but on the inside you can find some of the most amazing artwork. The Duomo offers four different sites. First is, of course, the interior of the main church. Second is the library, a special room inside the church. Third is the baptistry, a separate place under the church. And the fourth is access to the roofs. All the sites are spectacular and well worth the visit. The baptistry can be easily missed as it sits under the cathedral. It was built in the 14th century and its walls are covered with colorful frescoes. At the center is the hexagonal baptismal font made in marble and bronze. Bronze panels are showing the life of St. John the Baptist and two of them titled Faith and Hope were made by Donatello. Siena was always competing with Florence for domination and that is why Siena wanted a bigger cathedral than their rivals. However, due to war and plague they ran out of money and the building had to be modified but the east wall of the overambitious project is still standing. Impressive marble stripes of this 12th century cathedral are hiding an even more remarkable interior with amazing masterpieces of Italian Renaissance. It has spectacular marble mosaic floors, a 13th century pulpit sculpted by Nicola Pisano and other artworks of the most celebrated Italian artists. Inside the cathedral is an amazing library built in the memory of Pope P. II to conserve the rich collection of manuscripts he had collected. It was built by his nephew, Pope P. III. But the library is not famous for its manuscripts, but its amazing masterpieces on the walls from young Raffaello. The walls are divided into 10 scenes representing various parts in the life of Pope P. II. Siena is also famous for its desserts. The most famous one is a traditional chewy dessert containing fruits and nuts called panaforte. Crusaders used to carry panaforte on their quests and used it in surviving sieges. It is said that proper panaforte should contain 17 different ingredients, 17 being the number of contrade or city districts in Siena. Just as famous are the cantucci, the typical biscuits with almonds. They are twice baked oblong shape, dry, crunchy and may be dipped in dessert wine. Also from Siena are the Riccarelli biscuits that date back to the 15th century, since they were made of precious ingredients, mainly almond paste and whitened with icing sugar, honey and egg white, they were reserved for lords. As there is plenty more to see and experience in Siena, be sure to check the description below or scan the QR code to see the list of my favorite Siena tours and experiences. It is often overlooked that Tuscany also includes Mediterranean islands. One of them is Elba, part of the National Park of the Tuscany Archipelago and is known for unspoiled nature and beautiful beaches. A legend about Roman goddess Venus says that a goddess lost her pearl necklace during a sea bath. The pearls got scattered and created beautiful islands and the biggest pearl of them all is the island of Elba as it is the largest island of the Tuscan archipelago. The island is a great destination for outdoor lovers with many hiking and mountain biking trails and awe-inspiring beaches that are ideal for lounging around for an entire day. Elba also features scenic drives that offer breathtaking views of the coastline, mountains and picturesque landscapes. But the island is also famous for its history as it was used as a place of exile for famous French military and political leader Napoleon Bonaparte. If you consider this room to be a prison cell, it's not too bad, is it? This was the bed of Napoleon Bonaparte while he was on an exile on this island of Elba. Napoleon conquered almost the entire Europe but after his disastrous camping in Russia ended in defeat, he was forced into exile on Elba by European leaders. He could retain his title of emperor and a personal guard of 600 men. 
Napoleon was free to go anywhere on the island so long as he was accompanied by an English officer. In Porto Ferraio, you can visit Napoleon's residence to learn more about his time on the island. But even Napoleon considered Elba as a holiday destination as only after nine months he had enough and escaped from his exile for a short return to power. As there are many more beautiful places in Tuscany with plenty to see and experience, be sure to check the description below or scan the QR code to check my list of my favorite Tuscany tours and experiences. Thanks for your support and for watching and see you next time.